Hey, Milda. Milda. I took some of your stew last time I went into the wild. It kept me going for a week. I felt like I could have put a strider in a sleeper hole. Enjoy it while it lasts. Sounds like you're serving up some uh, impressive provisions here. Ah, <sighs> not again. You can have the discount too, but you'll have to come back later. I think you have me confused with someone else. Oven didn't send you? No. Oh, my apologies. It's just that his minions won't stop pestering me. <sighs> now I've even worn out my special grill. Since I'm in the midst of a crisis, perhaps you could skip to what it is you wanted? Some of your food? Of course. Your last customer mentioned your cooking really kept him going out in the wild. Where I'm headed, I could use some of that. I would be happy to oblige, especially since you have the decency to ask pleasantly. But? But my special groove griddle is no more. Without it, I can't cook any of my signature dishes. I hate to think what'll happen when I'm forced to refuse Olven or his goons. Even if I already had the right ingredients, there's nothing I can do. Unless you can source me a temporary replacement? What do you need? For the ingredients. A few pieces of decent wild meat, and I'd say a big handful of bitter leaf stems. That'll do. As for the griddle, a corrugated metal panel might suffice until I can have a new one forged. You'd likely find one in a scrounger pile if you follow the river to the northeast. Don't worry, I'll clean it first. <laughs> You'll have no issue finding boars and bitter leaf on your way. Assuming you're as much a hunter-gatherer as your clothing suggests. Thanks, Mildef. I'll keep an eye out. So that's what gratitude sounds like. And don't let anyone push you around, okay? If you say so. Ah, Savior! Over here! Savior, thank you for taking the time. My condolences that you had to endure Olvan's bloviating. I've dealt with worse. It sounds like he's really trying to put you over the barrel. The idea that the Karja purposely let Bristlebacks into the dawn, it's... It's completely absurd. But the louder and longer he says it, the more support he'll get for his damned concession decree. How did the Bristlebacks get into the dawn? No one knows for sure. The first report of them came from west of the quarry, but unless they have wings I don't know about, I don't see how they could have come over the mountains. No other way in. The only way I know about is barren light. Look, if you can get to the bottom of this, I can offer a considerable bounty in return. Help me shut Olvind up. What is this concession decree that Olvind wants? He wants the Sundom to designate portions of the Daunt as Osaram holdings. Only the portions, mind you, that produce any value. Let me guess, because he stands to profit somehow? Exactly. With the Daunt under Osaram law, he could secure more investment for their numerous ventures. He can't get those investments without the concession? No. Not while there's a chance the Sundom could revoke their access. Hence, why the concession is so important to him. And why blaming the Karja for the bristlebacks, no matter how absurd, works in his favor. How does blaming the Karja for the bristlebacks help Olven get his concession? Look around. This may be the Sundom, but chain scrape is all gears and rust and bad ale. Claiming that the Karja loosed the bristlebacks in order to intimidate Osaram laborers into obedience... Well, let's just say no one here has forgotten the atrocities of the Mad Sun King. Even with the valley working again, Alvant hopes he can stir up enough resentment against the Karja to call for a strike. And if the Osaram refuse to work unless the concession is signed, you won't have a choice. Correct. The reconstruction of Baron Light must continue. How did you get stuck out here? 
I asked for the posting, believe it or not. Overseeing the entire valley on behalf of the Sun King? It was an honor. Is an honor, I mean. But your job would be a lot easier without someone like Ulvind blasting hot air all the time? Ulvind's not going anywhere. He's been around longer than I have. Even fancies himself the founder of Chainscrape. I'll find a way to live with him. I have to. You said the Bristlebacks were first spotted west of the quarry? Yes, according to one terrified laborer, said the ground trembled before they came charging down the hillside. He took off and ran all the way here. Good place to start looking, then. If you learn the truth... Maybe Ulvant will stop blaming the Karja for every problem under the sun, and maybe then he'll actually focus on rebuilding Baron Light instead. To revel in some strike, sister? Let me set the board. I was just passing by. I. Mm, first timer, huh? Don't worry about it. I'll go easy on you. You got any pieces? Uh, no. Well, aren't you in luck then? I got an extra set. A Tanakh original straight out of the Forbidden West. Sit, 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 sit. I'll run you through it in a hot spark. I'll give you something special if you win it on my boards, too. Be here if you change your mind. Start off simple. The Tanakhs like to say that Machine Strike is a game of pure strategy. We each get a set of pieces. Each piece represents a kind of machine, and each machine is worth a different number of victory points. 
And to win the game, you'll need to gain seven victory points by destroying the opponent's machines. It can be tricky remembering the details of every machine, so we use these notes to keep track of them. You see that number on the top right corner? That there is how many victory points you'll get for destroying that machine. Notes also tell you how far a piece can move, how powerful their attacks are, the distance they can strike from, and of course, their health. Okay, that's enough for now. Let's just play. I'll explain the rest as we go. I own the board, so I get to choose who goes first. Since this is your first time, I'll let you go. Usually you get to choose which pieces to set on the board, but this will do for now. Pick up that machine piece to your right mm -hmm, and move it forward. And remember, each machine can only move a certain distance. Take a look at your notes if you need a reminder. Easy enough, huh? Now, you get to move two machines each round. So go ahead and pick a second. Perfect. There's not much else to do for now, so just end your turn. We're forging onwards. Let me move my pieces here. And we're back to you. This time, why don't you try attacking one of my pieces? Try with that machine on your right first. Now move the piece close enough to what When performing an attack, you'll be testing your machine's combat power against the opponent's. A machine's combat power is a combination of the terrain your machine is standing on and its own attack power. This board only has grassland terrain, which has no effect on a machine's combat power. And your current machine has two points of attack power. So in total, your machine's combat power equals two points. Since my machine isn't the one attacking, it has zero points of attack power. And just like your machine, it's not affected by grassland terrain. So right now, the difference in combat power between the two machines is two points. This means your machine can do two points of damage to my machine. Did you get all that? Knew you were a smart one. Finish up by attacking my machine. Not pulling any punches, huh? See how your machine can't move close enough to attack mine? You can make your machine sprint. That lets it move one space further. Try it out. Try sprinting up to one of my machines. Go ahead, just sprint over to my machine. If you sprint, you'll be able to reach my machine. If you sprint, you'll be able to reach my machine. Downside to sprinting is that your machine can no longer attack. Now, some players like to take a risk and overcharge their machine in cases like this. Overcharging lets you attack after a sprint, but it will damage your machine's health by two points. So use at your own discretion. Let's try doing that now so you can see what I mean. That's about it for your turn then. Now, I'll let you in on a neat trick. That machine of yours, the one closest to me, grab a hold of it. Same as in the wilds, machines have both armored points and weak points. You can see them marked on the pieces. Blue shows where their armor is thickest. 
Hit him there, and you'll do some damage, but not a lot. Now, red shows the machine's weak points. Hit those, and you'll deal a mighty blow. Here, let me show you. Rotate that piece so your machine faces mine. Now let that machine have it. Off the board she goes, and there's your first victory points. You don't have seven of them yet, so let's keep going. Your machine attacked mine, but hasn't moved yet. Go ahead and move downwards towards my remaining piece. You've already attacked a machine and moved your piece. But if you overcharge your machine, you can attack a second time. And by the look of your machine's health, you'd be sacrificing your piece to defeat mine. But sometimes, that can be a good thing. Overcharge your machine to attack mine a second time, and I'll show you what I mean. Ain't that a thrill? Now, because your machine was knocked out at the same time as mine, we both get the victory points our machines are worth. Good news is, since you're the one attacking, you're gonna receive your victory points before I do. Which means you can reach the coveted seven victory points first. That's why sometimes losing a piece can be the best way to end a game in your favor. Now, you'll notice you didn't get quite up to seven victory points this time, but you did destroy all my pieces. That means you're the winner. That wasn't so hard, was it? Just remember to always check for the best terrain to attack from. You'd be surprised the advantage you can gain over an opponent like that. I know it saved my behind in a game or two. I'll try and remember that. Oh, before I forget, these are all my spare pieces. I want the savior of Meridian to have them. It's a small set to be sure, but it should be enough to get you in on any strike games you find out there. You might even fancy looking out for them strike carvers. They've got all kinds of unique pieces that can turn a game in your favor, though they'll need the right materials to craft you one. Or you might find them in the wilds if you're lucky. No, I've lost my fair share of pieces after a night of machine hunting or brew hopping. <sighs> no need to thank me. Always a pleasure to help out new strike players. Now, if you feel like playing a real game, I've got plenty of other boards. I could even teach you a few more tricks if you're up for it. Thanks. I'll think about it. I knew I'd make a strike player out of you yet. How about this time I tell you how to use a board's terrain to your advantage? This one's got all the different terrains you can encounter in a game of strike. Knowing when and how to use them can mean the difference between victory and defeat. Terrain mainly affects your machine's combat power. As you know, when fighting an opponent's machine, you compare its combat power to yours. The higher your machine's combat power, the more damage you can do. So finding the right terrain is an essential strategy for overpowering your opponent. Here, I'll show you. Grab that piece to your left and move to attack my machines. Now let's take a look at your machine's combat power. Combat power is the sum of a machine's attack power and the value of the terrain it's standing on. Since your machine is attacking, it's using its two points of attack power. It's also standing on forest terrain with a value of one point. Add those together and your machine has three points of combat power. My machine is standing on grassland terrain with a value of zero points. It's also not attacking, which means their attack points aren't in play. So my combat power is zero. This means your machine can do three points of damage. Go ahead and test it out. There you go. 
Now, choosing the right terrain doesn't just improve your offense. It can also help defend your machines from attack. Grab your other piece and place it in front of my second machine. Since your machine is attacking, it's using its two points of attack power. It's standing on grassland terrain. This terrain has a value of zero. This means your machine's combat power adds up to two points. My machine can't use their attack power since they're defending their position. But they have the higher ground. They're standing on forest terrain, which is worth one point. This means my combat power adds up to one point. Now, the front of my machine is colored blue. This means that the spot you're about to attack has armor protecting it, which means my machine gets an extra point, giving it a total of two combat power points. If we compare the combat power of both machines, you'll see that you won't be able to do any damage. Whenever you're unable to top an opponent's combat power, you can still choose to attack and break their machine's defenses instead. Go ahead, try it out and see what happens. Ha, see? When you break a machine's defenses, you can knock it backwards. Sure, both our machines will receive one point of damage, but knocking my machine off that terrain makes it more vulnerable to attacks. Not only that, if my machine had been blocked from moving backwards, it would have received an extra point of damage. And if my machine had been blocked by another one of my pieces, that machine would have received damage as well. That's why breaking a machine's defenses is a great way to deal damage to several pieces at once. Useful, right? Okay, now go ahead and end your turn. There's still one more thing I wanna show you. All right, as we've seen, the higher the terrain, the more it'll add to your machine's combat power. However, there are two other terrains that work a little differently. This is what we call a chasm. Only flying machines can be placed on those. But it'll take away two combat points if you do, so be wary. This is marsh terrain. Landing on it will take away one combat power point from most machines. It'll also keep your machine from moving for the rest of the turn. Here, let me show you. Grab that machine on your left. See, all you can do now is wait for your next turn to move again, or you can overcharge your machine to get out of there. You can still attack any nearby enemies so you're not completely helpless. Well, I think that's enough yammering for me for now. Promise it'll all come in handy next time you play. Here for more tips? Why don't I tell you a bit more about the pieces we used to play? In a normal game, you get to choose which machines you place on the board. Each one is worth a certain number of setup points, and you can spend up to 10 assembling your army. Knowing what each machine brings to the game and building an army that matches your strategy is the key to becoming a machine strike master. When assembling your army, there are a few things to keep in mind. First and foremost, you can never have more than four of the same machine on the board at the same time. With that in mind, most players would choose machines based on how far they can move or how much attack power they have. But a real strike player will be looking at a machine's type and skills. Let's take a quick look, shall we? Pick up that machine on your left. All right, let's talk about the different ways in which a machine attacks its opponents. In other words, its machine type. If you look at your notes, you'll see this machine here is a melee type. You can also tell by the shape of the base the piece stands on. A melee type machine attacks the first enemy within range and no one else. We've seen this plenty of times, so just move that piece forward so I can show you some more stuff. Great, now grab your other machine. Looks like we've got ourselves a gunner type machine here. This means they'll only hit the farthest enemy in their attack range. Let's move that machine forward and end your turn so we can take a look at the rest of the pieces. Time to look at the rest of the pieces, Red. 
Let's go with this piece first. This is a ram-type machine. Attack an enemy with it, and it'll push the piece backwards. Like this. See, now my machine has taken over your machine spot on the board. This is a great way to take the advantage away from your opponent if they have the higher ground. Looks like we have one more piece to look at. Now this is a beauty of a piece, a dash type machine. When it attacks, it'll move to the end of its attack range and damage every machine in its path, including your own. So make sure you take a good look at the board before you send it off to the races. You should also make sure it's able to finish its attack on an empty spot. Otherwise, you won't be able to attack at all. Here, I'll show you. Look, it even rotated your piece. A nifty little piece you'll definitely want in your set. If you look at your notes, you'll notice this particular machine has one of the skills I mentioned before. There's quite a few of those, and we haven't even looked at all the machine types yet. But I'm pretty sure you've got more important things to do, so I made you a list. It's got all the tips and tricks we talked about, too. I think that about does it for now, so if you want to play a real game, just let me know. Let's play! Okay, let's see. That's it for me. My turn. Gotta say, your odds aren't good, Red. Well, that's done now. Now that was a game, even if I lost. This is gonna be fun.
time to make my move. Board's all yours. to get serious. One less piece on the board. What a hit! Off the board it goes. Come up. Your turn. Your move, Red. I got a tough fight ahead of me. You're up, Red. You got me. Fair and square. 